Um, we're not going to see this morning. I want to try and get through quite a bit today. Um, I've got to tell you, I've been studying these parables over the last week. Um, some of them are just really so scary. They really are. I've sat um, probably the entire day in a dwell yesterday after reading some of these parables that come out of our Lord Jesus' mouth. And um, there's a parable I'll probably share with you next week, but I want to share one or two or three parables this morning with you so that you would know how our Lord Jesus looks on people, how He looks on sin, and how He also looks on those that have gone astray. <coughs> um, and I want you to hear this this morning, but I really, truly need God's help today. Please, Holy Spirit, to guide my mouth, my, my talk, that you would receive this word with, with cheer, that you would receive this word with warning, that you would receive this word with gladness of heart. So, yeah, let's pray. Our Father and our God, you who created the heavens with the spoken word, you who formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed your very breath into his lungs, into our lungs, you who knew us before we were even in this tent, in this body, it's just too wonderful for my mind. It's too marvelous. And I guess that's why I worship you, Lord. Because I do understand you sovereign. I do understand, as we were speaking earlier, that all our days are numbered. We have a number. There is a line as my brother said, that has been drawn already. So, as your word says, teach us to number our days so that we would grow and gain a heart of wisdom. I ask you for this word this morning that you would lead me, that you would guide me, Holy Spirit, that you would be, help me unfold and unpack and exegete your word the way it should be done without giving my own clever ideas into this. And I pray for the family. Sitting here and the family that I absent this morning, would you be with us and with them? In Jesus' name, Amen. If you go to the, to the Gospel of Luke from chapter 9 through 19, you will see that our Lord Jesus started traveling. And from Luke chapter 9, verses, 9, verses at least from 51 through to 19, and then 20, 21, 22, 23. It's called the traveling stories, or the, the traveling ministry of Jesus, because from Luke chapter 9, at least from verse 51, Jesus starts traveling because he has one goal. He needs to get to Jerusalem. And what happens to our Lord at Jerusalem? He gets crucified. And of course, his main goal, this is why the Son of Man came, so that he might come and destroy the works of the devil. And he knew it from the day he went into ministry that his objective was to get to Jerusalem and die on a cross for the sins of man but for those who would believe. And you see, there's always a but within the scriptures, and an if. You know, when you see a but and an if, it's a probability, not a certainty. And this is what sometimes gets to me, because this is why I sit in the dwell, because I understand that there's just so many people attending their every Sunday religious church, thinking that they are fine, but there's that but and that if. And then if I look at the sovereignty of God, as I know it's a long word, it means He is just in charge. He does as He pleases, as the Bible teaches us, and He chooses who He pleases. And I read these, these parables, and from Luke chapter 9, just parable after parable after parable, and there just seems to be this theme 
of the super righteous and the sinner. That Jesus stands against those that are self, self-contained, self-sufficient, thinking that they're in right standing with God, and he actually stands exactly diametrically opposed to that type of mindset. And yet he seeks out wherever he goes, he seeks out perseveringly, insistently, persistently, he seeks out the scum. Those who would deem themselves never good enough for God. He seeks them out. And he contrasts when he seeks them out. He contrasts those people with those people who think, I'm fine. It's, it's all good and it's all well with my soul. <clears throat> and yet the truth is it's not. And possibly next week we're going to get to Luke chapter 16, which is probably the most frightening parable in the entire scripture. At least to me. And at least to people I listen to like R.C. Sproul and D.A. Carson and Dr. John MacArthur. And when I read those words in Luke chapter 16, I tell you, Frank, I'm not making this up. I get super duper worried. Because it is the most scariest parable of all parables that Jesus that ever comes out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus. But today I want to go to Luke chapter 15. And um, I don't have time, I would love to start at Luke chapter 9 and go through parable after parable. It would be so lovely and maybe we will just do that sometime and just see at the heart of our Lord Jesus. Um, but so just to let you know what a parable is. A parable doesn't have many meanings. It's got one central <coughs> meaning all the time. It may very well have a thousand applications. But within a parable, and this is why it's so, so um, intimidating for one like me, because I cannot read, I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to read into this text or these parables, that which is not actually there. I need to get to the core of what Jesus is in fact saying then comparatively to now, so that you would grasp the loving, compassionate heart, and yet the stern heart of our Lord Jesus. So as we read these parables, I just, as I pray, I pray that God would open your heart and He would allow me to, to, to explain this in a good form to you this morning, so that you would understand what Jesus says in His Word. So there in Luke chapter 15, I'm going to read three parables to you because they've all got to do with the same thing. And in fact, if you leaf over, it's got to do with the same thing. And if you leaf over, it's got to do with the same thing. And then of course, I'm going to jump over to Matthew and there's a similar parable to what Jesus speaks here in Luke. And as he is, he's a traveling preacher. And as you would know, preachers sometimes say the same thing, but in different contexts. We all know that that's common. I mean, um, mothers do that, fathers do that, human beings do that. You might give an, a, 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 an analogy to some person, and you might use that same analogy with another person, but in a completely different context. Our Lord was exactly the same. Exactly the same. And this is the thing with, with, with reading the scripture. You would get the, the people saying, ah, you see, the Bible contradicts itself. Here in, in Matthew 18, Jesus is saying this, but here in Luke chapter 15, he's saying this, and we say, aha, no, 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 no. This is our God speaking to us, and he's speaking to us so individually that he treats you as individuals. So that whatever he said to Joe Soap over there, he might use the same analogy and say something completely different to you right now, in your category, in your circumstance, and wherever you find yourself in life. And that's how wise our God, the incarnate Jesus, was when he was birthed in human form into this world. Let's read together the parable. Look, let me just say, the Bible, I was telling my wife, the Bible was one continuous passage. It never had headings. We're lucky for headings. You know, scholars have given us headings. But we don't, the Bible was never originally re, um, written with verse number or headings. It was one continuous scroll. And we're fortunate today to actually have little headings to give you a heads up what's coming. So we're grateful to those scholars. So it starts at Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep. 
Now, the tax collectors and sinners. Get that in your minds. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, to who? To Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after that one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together all his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep that was once lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. We're going to get to that. Can I repeat that? So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 sinners who need no repentance. Okay, actually, not sinners. Righteous people. Who need no repentance. Second parable, which they have titled the parable of the lost coin. Remember, there's a thread here, so just follow these little stories. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the entire house and seek diligently until she finds that coin? And when she has found it, she calls together her friend and neighbor, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. So just, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. <coughs> parable 3. And this one you would know all too well. The parable of the prodigal son. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share, not a share, the share of property that is coming to me. And he, the father, divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need, dire need, desperate need, beside himself. So he, he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. But no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I'll perish out of hunger. I will arise and I shall go to my father. And I will say to him, This father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as if I were a hired servant. And he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you are no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and let us all celebrate, for this is my son who was dead, and he is now alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home. And your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back in sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. 
But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you and I've never disobeyed one of your commands, yet you never even gave me a young goat that I might celebrate it with my friends. But when the son of your, this son of yours comes home, who has devoured your property, and with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. See, I get tearful because I just see so much in this parable. Three things to note here in the Palestinian world in the first century. You had the religious elite, and our Lord makes use of three types of people over here. <coughs> Shepherds, women, and children. They were the outcasts of society. People looked down on shepherds. They were scum. Men looked down, especially the elites, looked down on women. Although they were barefooted, pregnant in the kitchen. And they looked down on the children. Because they were delinquents. And they had no time for them. These are the largest elite of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their scenes. So Jesus tells these self-righteous Pharisees a story that should blow their minds on how he sees humanity and who he sees fit to choose. And how he deems his word to go out to anyone he chooses and open the ears and the eyes of the blind to anyone. I want you to notice something. It says the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled against him. If we go back to Exodus chapter 15 and Numbers, you will find that the same word is being used of the Pharisees that was used of the Israelites. This is a, a passive word. It means from past to present, and it will continue into the future, grumbling always unsatisfied with light, always unsatisfied with truth, always unsatisfied with what God wants for us, always. Even with truth were to be put right in front of many people, they would be grumbling. So it's a passive word. And quite rightly so, because then in, in, we'll find in the book of Exodus, you will remember, they had their great Exodus, they came out of Egypt, what was the very first thing they did, pre past, present, continuous? Kept on grumbling. Oh, you should have left us in Egypt. There we had melons and leeks and all these lovely things. But yet, the irony is they were under slavery. They had no identity. They had no name. And yet God chooses to bring people out of slavery, people out of bondage, and give them a name. And, he, and, and Jesus comes in truth and light and sets himself before these people and speaks truth to people. And you have the elite, those that are comfortable with their self-righteousness, who are ever pointing to other people and showing up their sins because I'm just so good. I don't do what Stephen does. And this is a passive, present, continuous, indicative English word which means you've been doing it all along. There's no way I'm going to persuade you. You're just a perpetual grumbler. You've always got something to say against God. You're never satisfied with God. And that's why you would find the book of Matthew, actually the book of John, where he actually indicts the Pharisees and says the biggest blasphemy you could ever do that will send you straight to hell is actually blaspheme the name of God, the Holy Spirit. Because when truth comes in and you know it's truth and you know that everyone knows it's truth and yet you reject that truth, you're a grumbler. It's not about not getting into a thick skull because you understand it. You know it to be true. Your heart tells you, your conscience tells you, but yet you turn and you grumble and you continue to grumble against God. So he puts these type of people into their own category. The self-righteous religious elite that cannot be reached. 
the ones that can be reached, <coughs> the scum, those who people would say, never, ever, Marcus, Judy, never in a million years. So Jesus seeks people <coughs> like you. All the time. With your big mistakes and your big mess ups. Go and read the parables. If I look at this passage, this at least the very first parable, he starts out with a, a common thing, which was common to their vernacular, their speech, their idiomatic thinking, their type of culture of those days, shepherds, sheep, everyone knew what sheep were. But I want to point something out to you that is just marvelous and yet scary at the same time. Follow me with this. I'm going to repeat the story. Which one of you, having 100 sheep, has lost one sheep, and then he goes and takes the 99 sheep and leaves the sheep as sheep? Sheep and leaves them in the open field and goes after the lost sheep. And when he has found the lost sheep, you can see the lovingness of Jesus. He actually puts the sheep over his shoulder. And he goes and he rejoices before people. But then he says something which is ironic to this parable. And hear me very carefully. The point of this parable is speaking against your self-righteousness and God's righteousness. That is the point. So we don't want to digress and go outside of the parable, but you need to see some irony over here, which, which you, you cannot miss. Because Jesus goes on to say, let me read it to you. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. Self-righteous. There's more joy in heaven when God comes to any person of you and your eyes open, there's an openness in your heart and you receive Christ and you know you need repentance, you know you need Him, you know you, you just need His sanctification, you know you've messed up, you know you're a wretched sinner, you are undone without Him. And there, when He finds you, He rejoices with His Father and the angels in heaven because He has found and someone has found Jesus. And then He goes on to say that the 99 supposed righteous people, what does the Bible say? There is no one righteous, not even one. So you have to see the irony that Jesus deliberately put into this passage. Heaven is shouting with joy over one person, or even two, or three, and we can go on and on, who genuinely receive Christ. Then those who are wallowing and reveling in their own self-righteousness better than thou, better than thou, at least I'm not a thief, at least I don't swear, and at least I don't smoke, at least I don't do this, look at so and so, look at so and so, and God saying, Jesus saying, for goodness sake, Take the plank out of your eye. Take the tumble ball out of your eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. So the point of the parable is finding the scum. Finding those who do not even deem themselves to be good enough for Christ. Because you've messed up. But he's looking for you. Searching for you. And then he just gets at home. Those self-righteous people who are, think they're righteous. Heaven doesn't rejoice. But heaven rejoices over one. Jesus is saying these things. Because from when he starts his traveling, he is up. These Pharisees, these elitists and Sadducees, and these Essenes, they send out this delegation who are continually hounding him. And then as Jesus travels, Samaria, Judea, wherever he goes, these Pharisees are always there. Self-righteous, trying to trip him up on every single thing. Trying to trip him up so that they would seem righteous and that scumbag of a shepherd, that scumbag of a woman, that scumbag of a child, and we go on and on. 
We can prove that we live by the law and there's no hope for them. So from Luke chapter 9, you will find this in the Gospels as well, there Matthew. Jesus that put in the traveling Wilbury. That matters. And he's forever, forever speaking against that which you think, which you think is making you righteous before him. Then he goes on to say about a woman. And yeah, I need to warn you, this is not universalism. You know, this, ten, this passage, Luke 15, 8 to 10, has been taken as a universalistic um, uh, um, stanza. That this woman, that means that Jesus loves everyone and the whole world is going to, to heaven. Is that, does it, that's not even true. That's not even true. By biblical standards, yes, Jesus died for God so loved the world. But it goes on to say, for those only who receive. He came to his own, from John 1 12. He came to his own, but his own did what? They did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, he gave them the right to become children of the living God. So he's forever up against this. He had a mission. He's going, he's got his eyes set on Jerusalem. This thing is about the lost. Not about a stray backslide, he's going to get to that. But it's about the lost, those who don't know Jesus. Those who don't have a hope in, in hell. And he tells these parables. And he goes to get to the parable of the woman. And she seeks, he's trying to show a picture of the Father's heart who will seek and seek and seek. Let me ask you one question. Because this is all figurative stuff. Do you think God doesn't know where you are? For one moment. Do you think He has to actually find you? Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Let's talk about that for a moment. What happened? The serpent came unto Eve. And we have the story of falling, you shall be like gods. Well, the story unfolds some more, and they take off the food they eat, and they first thing do they do is they get exposed to the sun, they're naked, and in that moment, God comes and says, Adam, where are you? Do you think for a moment God did not know where Adam was? Yeah. Think about it. God knew very well where Adam was. You know why the question is posed? While we say Jesus, while Jesus says he finds you, where God, why God says, Adam, where are you? Do you know why the question is posed? So you can jump up and say, Yeah, I am. I've cocked up. Here I am. Where are you? Where are you? But to the self righteous, they don't jump out of the bush with their shame and fig leaves and all this stuff. You know where I am. I'm high on my chair. I'm super righteous. But for the sinner, the one that Jesus touches, jumps up immediately and says, Ah, by the way, not. Say, Ah. Here I am, God. Here I am. I've messed up. So he goes, the point of these parables is he goes to seek and save. The lost, not the self righteous Not those who think they've already done all their things that please God. Because your righteousness, my dear friends, I've told you this before, is like a woman's menstrual cloth, right? Jeremiah. Like a filthy rag. But it's for you to jump out of that bush and say, God, here I am. Here I am. Again, it's you and you alone have us. That's the point of the parable. You come up against self righteous people. Have you, you, you come up against self righteous people? That you, there's nothing you can say that will allow them to see that they're actually in sin? Not because you're better than them, but they're in desperate need of the, of the, 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 the salvation of our Lord, and they're just blind. And they're just all right. I get my cat. I've got no consistency. And of course, you get to know all the prodigal son. 
I want to jump in here, but I won't get too much into this. <clears throat> you can relate later today. But I want you to understand the severity of this, this thing and the Father's heart. Now, in ancient East, Eastern culture, this is how it worked. The elder son, Yay, would get two thirds of Papa's inheritance. You will only get one third. Okay, that's how it works. Okay, so in other words, your older brother is actually your boss. That's how it worked. But now the son goes to the father and says, No, father, okay, you, you, you need to grasp this now. This is, this, is, this is really touching. The younger son goes to his father, preempting his inheritance. So in other words, I want my inheritance now. But what it actually says is, I wish you would die now so I can have my inheritance. Because there's no way in ancient Eastern culture that the dad would actually give his inheritance to his younger son before he even hit the grave. It's, it's not even common. It, 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 it's just the most craziest thought to a Jew, to a Hebrew. So Jesus gives this picture to say that the son has actually got the audacity. This is the lost son. By the way, both sons were lost. But this is the son, the audacious sinner, who goes to his father. He says, I want my inheritance. I want to go and squander it. But what he's actually saying is, Dad, I wish you would die. Drop down right now and die. So his dad gives him his inheritance. And he goes off and he squanders it. But look at the most astounding thing out of this parable. His dad knew he was lost. But his dad runs to him. To him. When he sinned against his father. When Adam sinned against his creator. When you and I sinned against our God. Who comes running? Our God. Our Savior. Our Jesus. Our Redeemer. Comes running. That's how audacious our hearts are. That's how audacious sinners. But God forbid that you be found amongst the self-righteous where you cannot see yourself in this picture that you have sinned against God. I have sinned against God. That's the point of these parables. You've got family that you could shake. No one listen. Self-righteousness. If it drives our Lord nuts, and I don't know what it drives us, you can I don't know. But this is about saving the lost. You need to see God, Jesus' heart now. That He cares about the outcast, the widow, the orphan, the woman, the children, the shepherds. And if we were to bring shepherds across into our day and age, I was a mechanic, by the way. Blue pants, overall pants. I don't know if you can, any of you can actually even think about that. But I wore blue pants, overall pants. Blue dust coat, always oil, oil under my hands. And I'll tell you the truth, this is the truth. I was always looked down at the point. Didn't matter what degree I had. And by the way, I excelled at college. I was the top student. So I thought, wow, you know. But whenever I'd walk into the office, people would just look me up and down. So much I wasn't even allowed to even use their telephone. Because I was a mechanic. With dirty hands. So this mechanic takes two machines, so that you would have a job to actually pick up the telephone. Jesus is looking for the mechanics. He's not looking for the lawyer. Jesus is looking for the two boys. He's not looking for the president. He's looking for the sinner. He's not looking for the self-righteous. Come as you are, because that's how he found you, as you are. Matthew. Same parable, different context. Again, parable of the lost sheep. And again, may I please beg of you to go and read your Bibles and go and read what precedes this parable and see what Jesus says, what he says here, yeah? and also regarding Luke 15. Go and read Luke 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Go and read it. And you will be blown away by the heart of our Lord Jesus. Matthew 18. I want to just 
give you a bit of a context here. So let me just take it, give you a bit of heads up. From verse 1, and I'm going to skip down to the parable. At that time, verse 1, 18 verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he puts him in the midst of them and says, Truly, Amen, in Greek, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like a child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You receive, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, listen to me, whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Let's go to the parable from verse 10, the parable of the lost sheep. See that you do not despise any of these little ones. We've just spoken about little ones. He draws a child to it, puts him on his knee, and he gives this illustration. And he goes to the parable of the lost sheep. Still with this little one in mind. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that, the, that in heaven their angels always see the face of my God who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety nine on the mountain and go in search of them? The one that went astray, he's using a different Greek word here, a different English word. The other one was lost, this is astray. The Greek gives you two different words. And if he finds it, Amen, truly, I say to you, he rejoices it over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Now we've got a whole new ball game here. So it is not the will of our Father who is in heaven that one of these other ones should perish. Now Jesus is talking about the backstory question. Not talking about the lost. Now he's showing his care for those that have fallen away. I think the Bible only mentions the word backslidden ever in the book of Jeremiah, but the application still remains the same over here. They have gone astray. And his heart, you've got to see this church, his heart is that he's going to go and find you. Because he's chosen you. And he cares for you. Yes, you may have once have been lost, and now you found, but now it so happens that some of us have gone astray. So he's hounding you. And he even goes to say that the 99 who have not gone astray, not self-righteous, but they are still mature and they're serving Christ with, like, with all their heart. They are okay for the moment. But that one who has left me and gone astray, I want him back. And the gates of hell will not even prevail, because I won't do that. Two parables, two applications. You have to understand that God's called you, He finds you. And when you go astray, the implication is you know you've gone astray. You know it. Why? Because he comes after you. Probably shouting like the Father in Luke 15. Running towards you. You can even hear his voice as you try to get away from him. Come back. Come. That's all we have consciences. But here's the point of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, this might not be the point of the parable. But my point is this. Because we're talking about little ways. Not necessarily, he used a child, I don't know how old the child was, but he used a child as an illustration. But the point of his illustration is this. There are mature Christians amongst us who have been walking with the Lord for a long time. And by the way, maturity knows no age. I don't care if you're 73 or 23. If you've come to Christ at the age of 73, you're a little one in Christ's eyes. Get them in your mind. You're a little one. You might be 47 and be mature in Christ more than that 73 year old. But that 73 year old is a little one in Christ. And what does God, Jesus say here? If anyone of you who are mature, dare, dare, cause any of my little ones, those ones I've just called, to go astray, 
Woe to you. Ta monster around your neck and go and drag yourself. Because I've got now a lot of running to do off to that person, but you can't do that. Do you see the severity? You see, we breeze over this. Oh, wow, what a lovely story. She, <laughs> okay, that's not like hiding. And we don't see the passion of our Lord Jesus, how he feels about the lost, and how he feels about his people that have gone astray. But then he nails it. He says, God forbid you are the one that caused the strain, caused that person to go astray. That little one in me. God forbid you are the one. Read the Bible every day, you shall grow, 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 and as the song goes. The point of the matter in this parable is that he finds those that have gone astray and lost their love. But he also warns that don't presume just to say so much any nonsense about Jesus to other people who are young in Christ. She might have submitted her life to, to Jesus a week ago. And she's really hungry. You know, only the Holy Spirit can do this. I know this to be true. Only He can cause this hunger. We all know this. I'm not teaching you and you sing here. You know this to be true. And I decide, listen, I want to get my wife into eschatology and you know, all the stuff in times. And I start preaching a lot of garbage to her. And it takes her mind from God onto aliens. I'm just being really stupid now. But just hear me for a moment. But takes her mind of what the Bible says about God and her love for God and everything that she's experienced the last week. And I take that little one and start teaching her nonsense from this ugly man for mine. And I cause her to go astray. Woe to me. That's why I think you have to be very careful what I say from my mind here. So you need to be very careful what you say to your workplace, what you say to people, and any other garbage that comes out of your mouth that you think to be true of the Bible when it's not even true. It can cause someone else to go astray. Believe you me, I've seen it, I've been around long enough. I became a Christian in 1985. I fell away. I came back, but I've been around long enough to see the garbage that comes out of people's mouths when they don't read the Word of God. They read a little fantasy and a whole doctrine comes out of that fantasy. Doctrine of alien, doctrine of demons, and demonology, if you poop hard enough, a demon will come out. And all that garbage that comes out of Christian mouths, beware if you presume or assume to teach that to someone else. And cause that person to take their eyes off, their fixation off the majesty. You see, these parables are full, full with the heart of Jesus. Full with the heart of Jesus. Because if he was to reach Jerusalem, he needs to have said all that he can say as he's walking to Jerusalem. And by the time he gets to Jerusalem, they have that feast. And you know the story, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they shout those and those and the wild they wave their palm branches. And then, soon afterwards, Jesus gets arrested, gets interrogated by Pilate and by Herod, and then gets crucified. But he got crucified because that was his main objective. Because while he's getting to Jerusalem, he's saying all the things that are necessary to make them understand the cross of Christ. By the time he gets there, they know that they know, like the Roman soldier said, Behold, this truly is the Son of God. Now I want to water this down, but I also want to say this with some sensitivity. I bet my bottom dollar that a lot of us have gone astray because we're too guilty when we think that God looks down on us and we're not good enough. I bet my bottom dollar and I'm not in America. That's not the word of our Lord. That's not how He sees you. We spoke about guilt and all that stuff last week. But this is the thing, if you think you're fine and you don't need God, which I know to be true with many people, I do know this, then you're in deep, 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 deep water. Deep water. I can 
reach until the cloud clouds go green, come running over yonder, over those rolling hills. You will never grasp it. Because as the word of God says, these things are spiritual. They speak to the heart. If you jump back to Luke 15, where it says about that one sinner who was called to repent, and of course is joined him. If you look at that word, it means present, continuous, and actually, actually, so we're going to give you all these English things, but at least you're learning some English here. It's an active participle. What does that mean? An active participle means it's happening now, and it's going to happen now, and it's going to happen now, and it's going to happen again. If he finds one sinner who repents, it means I'm repenting now, and I'm repenting again, and I'm repenting again, because I need you, Lord, and I know how filthy I am, and I just need you. I'm sorry. I just need you every single day. That's what that text means. Then there is rejoicing in heaven because the truth of man's heart is revealed. That's how hungry he is for Jesus. That's a present active participle. You're always at the feet of Jesus. And not necessarily repenting because you committed whatever sin over and over, then you're stupid. You only repented, you need deliverance. But that word repentance is not necessarily always just coming with the same, it's saying, I long for you. I need you all day long. Present, continuous, pushing forward. Making sense? <coughs> you know, you read these things and you think they're like, they are, they are Sunday school stories. You know, kids' eyes light up when you tell them about sheep and camels and all those things. And they mention maybe kids' eyes light up. But unless we become like those kids, then the Bible tells us we will never see the kingdom of God. You see, kids sometimes understand more than we do. We're just too complicated. We want to read things into text and what sheep, how many sheep were there? Were there 99? Were there 100? Well, Jesus, make up your mind. You know, we get all complicated. Jesus saying, this are, in fact, let me just tell you one thing. This is meant, these parables you see right from the beginning is not for the wise. It's not for the wise. The wise will never understand. Them. In fact, he confines the wisdom of the wise. wise. One point in this but for those who are not familiar to Jesus, will understand these such things because it's spiritual. My challenge again: go and read God's Word and see the richness for your wealthy and your family and your spiritual nourishment in the Word of God. And I always say, find yourself at the feet of Jesus. Find yourself in the text. Because if you find yourself outside the text, then you're self-righteous. You don't even need this text. Do you see the passion of our Lord? Mm. Do, do, do you see the passion of our Lord? Mm. Count it all joy that He found you on that duck. Count it all joy when He found you where you were. I could you like near from my heart. Every day, actively going to his feet. Father, we thank you. There's so much value loaded into these verses. Uh, uh, if I were to cover the Lord, I think I'd, I'd have a low attendance next week because we'll be going on for hours. <coughs> But Lord, one thing I do know is you've made it marvelously clear how passionate you are about the lost. You've made it crystal clear how you're passionate about those who have gone astray and those who have backslidden. Lord, help us to see. Help us to see who we really, really are. We're not mighty. You're mighty. Mighty to save. 
even if we count ourselves amongst the redeemed, we are no more special than any other person amongst the redeemed. But Father, the goal is to be with you. That's the goal. When you went to the cross, Lord, your goal was to bring salvation, redemption, justification to mankind, to all those who would want to receive you. So again, Lord, if there are people in this church who think that they've messed up, there's no mess that is too big for you. Lord, I really, I really, I know that, I know that, I know that to be true. But Father, help them jump out the bush and turn to you and say, Yo, I am! Yo, I am! And acknowledge their sins. So that you might cleanse them and bring them back like the prodigal son. Father, even the angels in heaven rejoice over that one soul who has come back to you. And those 99 self righteous people. I pray this in Jesus' name.